All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, just for the record, if you don't understand what I'm saying here, now it's time to leave the room because I'm not going to speak French. My French is bad. Your English is probably much better than my French. Um, today I'm going to talk about a few theorems and paradoxes that every developer should know. Uh, first of all, a disclaimer. I am not a scientist or mathematician, uh, so I don't know the, all the nitty-gritty of everything, so it's going to be a very basic introduction uh, talk. Okay? Um, so let's just start and roll into the first paradox, and that's called the German tank problem. Has anyone heard of that, the German tank problem? Well, the Germans had problems with tanks, um, obviously. Uh, the German tank problem is this. Let's say we have a German tank, something like this. And a tank like that has a serial number, one way to identify this particular tank. In this case, it's written on the tank, number 15. So let's assume we are in the Swiss Alps. No, not Swiss. Uh, that's not um, the German Alps, Austrian Alps. And there's a battlefield. There's a battlefield with four different tanks. There are things we can say slash deduce at this point. Can we say, for instance, that the Germans have four tanks? Yeah, we can say with 100% certainty, right? Can we deduce or say that the tanks have five, or the Germans have five tanks? Well, they already have four, so five is plausible. Could they have like 1,000 tanks? It could be, but it's not very likely because we only see four tanks. What we can do is we can actually statistically define the number of tanks the Germans probably have, and that's with this formula. This formula says N equals, or almost equals, M, which is the largest number we saw on the tank, plus M divided by K, which is the number of tanks we see, minus 1. Well, in the example, we saw a tank with 72, and there are four tanks. So we fill in that information in the um, formula, and we get 89. So based on the fact that we saw only four different tanks, and the largest number was 72, we can deduce that the tanks of that the Germans have 89 tanks. Does that sound plausible to anyone? Yeah, well, maybe, kind of. So what they did in June 1940, the Allied intelligence estimated that the Germans had around 1,000 tanks. Statistical formula, like we saw before by capturing tanks, seeing tanks, they said, no, 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 there should be around 169 tanks, 96 tanks. Actually, it was 122. So the statistical formula was much better than the central of the Allied intelligence. One year later, they estimated 1,550 tanks, but the statistical formula says, no, we estimate 244. And it was 271, so it's really, really close. Uh, August 1942, um, I think intelligence just gave up. This, they gave the same number, like whatever. <laughs> Statistics said, no, around 372. And it was 342. So that's actually pretty, pretty close by just two bits of information. How many tanks do we see and what kind of identification does, does, the, tank, uh, does the tanks have? So how does this affect us in our daily work? Well, this is basically about data leakage. How many of you use a MySQL database? Pr pretty much everybody. <laughs> how many of you use auto increments? How many of you leak these auto increments on the internet? A little bit less, yeah. Um, we do it a lot, user IDs, invoice IDs, etc. What would happen if I have a new app and I say, we already have 100,000 users, come and register with us. And I register and I see I'm user 61. What's going on there? So with a little bit of information we saw, well, they probably don't have 100,000 users. They only have a few test users. What would happen if two months later I re-register again and I see I'm user 63? Not a lot has happened with that app. 
Um, so with all the kind of little bit of data leakage, we can get actually a lot of information. This is actually used to approximate the number of iPhones sold in 2008 by just asking people, what is your iPhone uh, identification number? Where did you buy it, uh, et cetera? And they put it in that statistical formula, a little bit more complex than that, but basically the same thing. And they did a very good estimation on how many iPhones there were sold by Apple. I actually did it myself. I have a subscription, monthly subscription on a service, and I get invoices. And every month, the invoice number increases. So these are the invoice number I get every single month, starting from July. If I get this information and I get the differences between each month, I see that in August, the difference is 67,000 or 6,700, September 7,000, 72,000, et cetera. So it's increasing the differences meaning they get more people, they need to do more invoices, etc. If we actually put that into uh, percentages, I get something like this. Well, you can't really see the dark ones, but the dark one upstairs is 108. So that was actually a very good month for there because they sold a lot of subscriptions, meaning they had to do a lot of invoices. Also notice that in the end of the range, they actually drop down a little bit. They're still increasing their customers, but it's going a little bit slower nowadays. So this is about a good time to sell, uh, to sell your stock in that company because it's really going a little bit less. And this is only from information I get by a monthly invoice, mon monthly invoice ID. Anyone send out invoice IDs? Yeah? Okay, so we'll take a look at stuff like this. What we want is to avoid semi, uh, semi-sequential data to be leaked. Um, some people say, oh, well, I do very clever things and add randomness and offsets, but that will not resolve the issue. Again, it's statistical information that will even out in a little bit. Uh, one thing you can use is, for instance, is UUIDs. You've probably heard of them. Uh, you can use that instead of information uh, like give a, a customer a UUID and not your primary key from your database, for instance. Uh, actually, I don't like UUIDs for that kind of things. I like um, something called short IDs or time-based short IDs, but it's pretty much the same thing. Anyone learned something from this? Cool. That was the easy part. <laughs> Let's go to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is this. Um, my office looks out into a pond, and then a the pond is a white swan. Since I'm doing a lot of work, I think a lot of, and I look at the pond a lot, and I notice there's a white swan, and I think, well, probably all swans are white because I'm only seeing one white swan. And then multiple swans appeared in the pond, all white. You see, there's evidence that those swans are white. And I start asking people, have you seen white swans? And they say, yeah, of course I've seen white swans. So there's a whole lot of evidence about swans being right. Because everybody says, yeah, I've seen white swans. Until this one shows up. <laughs> yeah, there goes my theory. What actually happened is what we called confirmation bias. Instead of disproving what we know, we try to prove what we already know. We're looking for white swans, of course. Everybody has seen white swans. But that's not the question we should ask. We should ask, have you seen anything but white swans? How many of you do unit tests? Not a lot of hands. Yeah, everybody, a little bit. Um, unit tests are not about proving that your code is right. That's your job. Your code should be right. Unit tests is about trying to disprove your code. If you can't do that by unit tests, your code is good. That's a whole different mentality of writing unit tests. There's a scientific experiment that was done, and it goes like this. I have three different numbers, two, four, and six. And if you already know that, then, then don't tell the answer, because if people want to try it, you can do it after the presentation. Two, four, and six. And the, th and the thing is, that number of those three numbers adhere a certain rule. And your job is to tell me the rule that, it, that they adhere. Could be a very simple rule, could be a very complex rule, but it's only one rule. You can ask me a lot of questions over and over and over again, unlimited 
amount of times, but you have to ask the questions in the form of numbers. For instance, do the numbers 8, 10, and 12 adhere to the rule? And I say either yes or no. And with that, you have to try to figure out the rule. And if you are reasonably sure, about 80% sure, then you should tell me the rule, and I will say yes or no. They did this experiment, and you would think, well, you have a limited number of tries, so everybody guessed it right. But only 21% of the people actually guessed it right. So that's not a lot of people. What they did is try to prove what they already knew and not disprove what they already knew. Uh, if you can't disprove it, that says more about the theory than if you can prove something. So confirmation bias is literally everywhere, especially when you do things like unit tests or everything. This is where TDD, for instance, is a really good uh, strategy because they do not to be biased on the code because the code hasn't been written yet. There's another thing a little bit similar to the confirmation bias. It's this. Again, it's an experiment that has been done and it says if a card shows an even number on one face, then the opposite face must be blue. So it's a very simple rule. Now the thing is, how many cards do we need to turn over to see if all the cards follow this rule? Now, even if you think for that for like five minutes, probably less than 10% of the people will get it right. Because it tends to be complex because we're talking about abstract things, colors and numbers. What we should do is take that abstract context and put it in another context. So I was thinking about what is the preferred context for developers, obviously, beer. So I rearranged the question a little bit. I said, if you drink beer, then you must be 18 years of older. So we have Coke, we have beer, 35 and 17. If somebody drinks Coke, do we need to know what age he is? No, probably not. If somebody drinks beer, do we need to know what age he is? Yeah. So we have to turn around the beer card to see if it's a number 18 or higher. If somebody's 35, does it matter if they drink beer or Coke? No. If somebody is 17, does it matter if they drink beer or Coke? Yeah, so we turn that one off. This is what's called cognitive adaption for social exchange. And it's basically trying to place your technical problem in a more social context. If I talk to managers, to customers, I try to think of my technical problem I have and put it in a more social context. Uh, with that. For instance, um, I work a lot with managers, so I usually use very, very small words. Um, besides that, um, I do like to use the building metaphor. You know, we are doing agile, so we are not discussing right now the colors of the curtains, but we are discussing is this the actual shape for the foundation you want, or do we need to change this, or do you want another room? So um, that makes more sense for them because they put it in a, because you put it in a context that your clients or your manager or whoever can actually understand and not your technical problem even though it is exactly your technical problem so if you know that and everybody agrees on the beer uh, uh, exercise then we can do this as well so again if a card shows an even number on one face then its opposite face must be blue so if somebody is of some card is five, do we need to know what the other side is? No, it doesn't matter. If a card is eight, so it's an even number, do we, know, do we need to know what the other side is? Yeah, it has to be blue. So we have to turn over this card to see if it's blue or if it's green. If a card is blue, do we have to turn it over? No, it doesn't matter. Because it can be any color. We only say that even number has to be blue, but other numbers can be blue as well. Green, do we need to turn that over? We need to turn it over because it has to be an uneven number, an odd number, because if it's even, then it has to be blue, so it doesn't adhere to the, real, to the rule. So we can actually figure out this, um, this assignment by putting it in a different context first. Anyone agree with this? This is one that probably everybody heard of, the birthday paradox. Who hasn't heard about the birthday paradox? Oh, still a few people, okay. Uh, I assume everybody here has a birthday. 
sort of, sort of, kind of. And here's the question. How many people does it take inside a room to have an over 50% chance that two people share the same birthday? So you start thinking, okay, let's assume 366 days in a year. Um, we need a 50% chance, so divided by two, about 183 people. Sounds about right. But it isn't. Actually, you only need 23 people in the room. So if you have a, a party or anything with about 23 people, try it out. 50% of, of the time, you will be uh, right and are two people in the room that share the same birthday. The thing about this paradox is that it's not really a paradox, but people do not grasp the idea that only 23 people are needed. They think, oh, we need a lot more people for that. How many people do we need to get 100% assurance that two people share the same room? 366 depends a bit on, uh, on leap year, of course. If leap year, then one more. So you need 23 to get a 50% chance, but you need 366 to get a 100% chance. So that's a lot of in between. The thing with this is that collisions occur more often than you realize. Who have heard about hash collisions? Yeah? MD5 is something that we can collide very easily. We did some collisions on SHA-1, I think. Um, the thing is, if you have a hash that's only 16-bit of value, which is not a lot anymore, but it used to be values that we worked for on occasion, um, we only need 300 elements to get a 50% chance that we do have a collision. Here's a nice one. Suppose I take a random integer between 1 and 100,000. How many attempts before we get a 50% chance on collision? 1,000? 10,000? Who thinks more? Who thinks less? 500? You only need 117 elements. You can actually try that, not, not right now, but after the presentation. Try to write a program that actually does it. And if you iterate it enough, then it will be around 50% of the chance that you will hit collisions after 117 elements. That's not a lot. Fortunately, we don't really care about that in our daily work. We use PHP, so it's not really that, um, uh, uh, that, that uh, um, important for us. But what you have to watch out are small hashes. If your hash is too small, then you might get collisions. Nowadays, when we do hashes, we do SHA-1 hashes, Git, for instance. But there are collisions in Git, of in SHA-1. So Git is actually trying to move to a more abstract layer of hashes so they can use different kinds of hashes that doesn't collide. Um, you have to also watch out for unique data because if you hash data, you might think that your data is always unique because you hash it. But it doesn't have to be. Just take a look at MD5 collisions, for instance, and you can create, you can upload files, and they actually generate MD5 collisions on the same file. So it's really easy to make collisions like that. So your data might be less protected as you might think. Okay. Let's do some quantum physics. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is not about Star Trek. This is also not about crystal meth. Although, if you're interested, I have the room upstairs. This is about a formula. This is the formula. Basically, it says the variance in position multiplied by the variance of the momentum must be greater or equal than a number, h bar divided by 2. Any questions? <laughs> it's about this. Um, if I throw a tennis ball with a certain amount of force in a certain direction, I can calculate pretty much everything. Where it's going to land, how long it takes, the arc of the tennis ball, etc. And if I do it 100 times in the same circumstances, it will do the same thing 100 times over again. It's very deterministic, our science. And it works with tennis balls. It works with sugar cups. It works with little grains of salt. But after a certain smallness, 
uh, you get things like atoms, and you can get electrons, and you can get even more into a core of an atom where you have things like leptons and baryons and mesons, etc. And at this point, our science doesn't work the way we think it works. It's not deterministic anymore. It's actually a matter of probability. What we think is going to happen happens for a lot of times, but not always. So for instance, um, what we can say here with the variance of the position is basically thinking about a certain element being in a certain position. We don't know that for sure. It could be here, it could be here, or it could be somewhere else. Um, but there's a range of variance for that, the range how far the, the uh, particle can be. And if that variance is very, very small, near zero, then we know less about the momentum because they are basically uh, uh, tied to each other. So what happens if that we know, for instance, a certain particle is at a certain point, then we know pretty much nothing about its momentum, its speed. If we know a lot about some particle speed, we don't know its position. This is actually buried into um, the world as we know it, only we don't see it because we're working on a macroscopic level. The more precise you know about one property, the less you know about another. This is basically in our developer's world about trade-offs. Who of you uses a framework? Okay, who of you has looked into the things, why should we use this framework? Pretty much everybody, yes. How many people have used or have searched uh, into why we should not use that framework? A little bit less. The thing is about trade-offs. If you're going to use Symfony, if you're going to use Sand, if you're going to use Laravel, it has a lot of benefits, but it always, always have drawbacks. It's pretty much inside the core of our existence that things have a drawback. I don't, well, of course I want to know about why we should use certain framework or certain technique or certain uh, cloud provider, but I also want to know what are the trade-offs. If you can't find trade-offs, then you have to look further because there's always trade-offs. I never heard about anything that is not, doesn't have a trade-off, except for Symfony. <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, some people say, well, you know what, that's all nice, but this is actually not completely true because this only happens when you observe certain things that something is not uh, predictable anymore. Well, actually, that's not true. That's something else called the observer effect. Um, has anyone, does anyone know what an Heisenberg is? A few people. Well, it's not something that's very common in C, of, uh, in a PHP, but it's very common if you go to lower languages like C, for instance. And Heisenberg is something that, for instance, you see a bug, and you run it through the debugger, and then all of a sudden the bug disappears. There is no bug. You think, oh, well, I've solved it magically. And then you run your code again, without debugging, and then all of a sudden that bug appears again. So the fact that you are trying to debug the problem makes the problem go away. Have fun debugging that stuff. This is what we call a Heisenberg, which actually isn't completely the, the correct uh, name. It should be called the observer effect bug, but somehow it doesn't ring as much as an Heisenberg. Okay. Let's talk about Benford's law. How many of you use of no Benford's law? How many of you pay taxes? I don't. <laughs> now, um, Benford's law is actually really nice. Benford's law says numbers beginning with a one are more common than numbers beginning with a nine. This is a default behavior for natural numbers. So for instance, if I get the top 25 of largest river uh, rivers in the world, then most rivers will have a length starting with a number one, a little bit less starting with number two, less with number three, etc. And I can do that for all kinds of things that I can think of. So for instance, um, this is actually the formula. So write it down so you can actually do, uh, do some cool stuff with it. Now actually, um, what I did is like, okay, so we can do that with population of 
large cities, we can do that with length of rivers, height of mountains, all kinds of stuff. But I was thinking, okay, well, maybe I'm a little bit biased because I'm looking for things. Well, let's try something that I think will never work. And what I did is I took a framework, just a regular framework or your PHP source code, wherever you work in, and I run this code. You don't have to worry about what it does, but basically it gives you a list of numbers with the number of files um, adjoined to it. So in this case, there are 1,073 files that have a length of 1 or 12 of 114, as long as it starts with a 1. There are 868 files starting with 2, 20 or 216 or just 2. A um, little bit less with a 3, a little bit less with a 4, a little bit less with a 5, etc. And I thought, okay, well, this looks like a uh, Benford's curve, so that pretty much uh, uh, follows it. So I tried it with some other things. So this is the Symphony framework I worked with. So I tried it with a few others. So with Laravel, with Sand Framework, with CakesPHP, and they all follow the same curvature. There's a line in there, a blue line, that is actually the Benford's law, and you notice that all frameworks pretty much follow the same thing except a little bit for percent framework, where it's a, there's a little dip in the five. So I always thought percent framework was a little bit shady, and now I know why. <laughs> no. Um, no, but this is actually, uh, it, it see, uh, you can see that they all follow the same, um, same path. And you can do this with pretty much your own code, and most likely it will follow the Benford's law as well. And this happens with all numbers, pretty much all numbers that are not randomly generated in some kind of way. So this also works for instance, your bookkeeping or your tax returns. So what organizations like, I don't know if they do it in France, but probably they will, but like the IRS and the Dutch taxes, they all run kind of um, these kinds of uh, tests to see if there's something fishy going on with your bookkeeping. So for instance, if you have a big spike in the four or five in your tax returns, then probably somebody will go over your tax return and see what's going on there. So the takeaway from this presentation is if you're gonna cheat on your taxes, make sure you follow Benford's law to get detected. Um, but there's all kinds of things what you can do with it. Of course, it's not the only thing they do, but it gives you an idea on how numbers behave. If I take, for instance, a system that will um, um, well, for, for instance, let's take a, a, a PHP a project and um, I take all the numbers from that. I take all the PHP files from that. Uh, then it will follow this. But if I take, for instance, uh, numbers generated by a random number generator, it probably won't follow this line, but it will be a square line, of a, a straight line because a random generator normally generates numbers pretty much the same way uh, the one will be generated as much as a five, as a seven, etc. So you can easily detect if somebody generates numbers or um, actually has natural numbers added to your system. Okay, um, normally I have, oh, I can do that as well because we still have some time left. Normally this is a presentation that takes a little bit longer. So I do one more. Which is called Bayesian filtering. Okay, sorry for that. Bayesian filtering, how many of you know Bayesian filtering? How many of you used Bayesian filtering? Pretty much everybody should raise their hand because Bayesian filtering is something that happens, for instance, when we have a spam filter. If you have a spam filter on your mailbox, like Gmail or your own, you probably use Bayesian filtering. Bayesian filtering is basically this. What's the probability of an event based on conditions that might be related to that event? So for instance, what is the chance that a message is spam when it contains certain words? 
And Bayesian filtering is basically this formula. The probability event A given uh, that event B occurs is the probability of event A multiplied by the probability event B if event A occurs divided by probability event B. This sounds a lot of, this sounds like a lot, but it's actually quite easy to implement this in, for instance, PHP as well. You don't need a lot of code for that. Basically, what we're trying to do is figure out the probability if a mail or tweet or comment or view view is a spam or negative or something like that. So let's try it with a small example. Let's suppose I have a guest book and I have 15 comments or reviews and I have 50 comments on that particular article. And 10 of those comments are marked as negative. 25 comments, uh, 25 comments are actually using the word horrible in their comment. Eight comments with the word horrible are marked as a negative comment. So in a Venn diagram, it would look something like this. But what we can do now is fill, on, fill in the values in the formula. So basically what I do is I take the negative, um, the fact that we have neg negative and horrible is P horrible given the fact that it's negative multiplied by P negative divided by P horrible. If we fill out those numbers we saw before, we get a number of 0.32 or 32%. So based on the fact that somebody used the word horrible in their comment, gives it a 32% chance that the comment is negative. So basically, a comment does not have to be negative just because somebody used the word horrible. Now obviously, you don't only use one word to indicate if something is spam or not, but you use multiple words for that. Um, you can do that like very difficult, or you can use something called naive Bayesian filtering, which basically takes all the different works, uh, words and put it together like this. So what basically your spam filter is doing is taking all the words that are negative or that are considered spam and run it through a Bayesian filtering and see what the percentage is that comes out of it. And if it's a high enough percentage, it will be marked as spam. You might want to filter it on stop words for first so that things like the and a will not get uh, used for uh, uh, filtering. You might also want to make sure that negatives are handled properly. Something that says not great is negative and it's not positive just because it, word, uh, it has the word great in it. And there's bonus points if you can spot sarcasm which isn't really that easy, obviously. Um, does anyone know what collaborative filtering is? No, it's something you probably use as well when you use Netflix. And it's basically like this. If a user likes product A, B, and C, what are the chance that they like product D as well? Which is something that um, is a little bit related to Bayesian filtering. It's, it's a little bit different. But there's a system called Mahout. Anyone heard of that? Mahout is a really cre uh, great tool for Apache. Um, and you can do all that kind of questions. So what you actually do is you train a system to know what products you like. And then based on that information, together with information from others, it will give you recommendations, for instance. So it's a sort of recommendation engine. Um, you have to be careful, though, because you have to be careful that your training set uh, doesn't get messed up. So for instance, if you mess up your training set, nobody can save you. Um, so for instance, I use Netflix, and I like things like, well, The Fall and Twin Peaks and Luther, I like that. But my uh, two-year-old kid um, watches Netflix too. So now the system thinks that I like Team Hot Wheels and Timmy Time and stuff like that. So honestly, I don't like it, but the system Netflix thinks I uh, like it, so this is why we have multiple profiles normally. Um, so that's something you have to be careful out when you're training something. If you train it incorrectly, you can't untrain it anymore. So this happens with Netflix, but it happens also for Bayesian filtering as well. Uh, Bayesian filtering is, for instance, really great if you're gonna, uh, if you're gonna use it uh, for um, putting remarks or comments on your articles or 
blog post or whatever you have on your site. If you have like a moderation queue, for instance, then you don't have to put everything in moderation queue. Um, but you can say, okay, if it's a, above a certain spam threshold, then we put it in a moderation queue. And if it's under a certain threshold, then we actually automatically post it on the website, for instance. So that saves you or your moderators a lot of work if you have a lot of comments. Okay, any questions? Hopefully not about quantum mechanics. I'm not very good at that. Okay, thank you.